So enable us to do that again. Lord, open your word to our minds, to our eyes. Give us understanding. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we look to the Word, I want to thank Jonathan for uh, being with us again. He'll be with us next Sunday as well. Steve is overseas on a business uh, trip, and so we appreciate Jonathan helping us out and the worship team again as always. So uh, thank you, Jonathan. One last thing. There is a new little book on the book rack called uh, How to Walk into Church. You will never walk into church the same if you'll grab that little book off of that rack and uh, make a great stocking stuffer, by the way, to get a few of them, put them in those stock. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it's a, a, just a very short little read, how to walk into church. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it, so take, take a look at that. J.I. Packer, who is a English-born theologian, a church statesman for sure, and a prolific writer. Probably his best known work is a book entitled Knowing God. And in that book, in the third chapter, he starts off with four questions that he asks and answers in this way. First question, what were we made for? To know God. Second question, what aim should we set for ourselves in life? To know God. Third question, what is eternal life that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. What is the best thing in life, being more, bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else, the knowledge of God. John Calvin said in his seminal work, the Institutes of Christian Religion, true and sound wisdom consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. I would suggest to you the best place to learn and the only place to learn about the knowledge of God that we desperately need and a true knowledge of ourselves is in the Bible. So we're turning again this morning to John 17, and as we do that, we want to see that the greatest need anyone has in this life, the greatest need that anyone has is the need for eternal life, our greatest need. Just a quick review. We are in the Gospel of John, as I said. John's Gospel, out of the four Gospels, is the most unique of all the Gospels. That is, John gives us material that nobody else gives us. The other three Gospels have a lot of similar things. John's Gospel records what no one, none of the other writers do. And one of the things that he speaks of is something called the Upper Room Discourse, or at least that's the way we have entitled it. In John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, we have what has often been referred to as the Upper Room Discourse. Now, if you think it's called that because it took place in an upper room, well, then you're exactly right because that's why we call it the Upper Room Discourse. Most of it took place in the Upper Room. They left the Upper Room at the end of chapter 14, but most of that time Jesus was there with his disciples and he was teaching them. We do know that it was his last night to be with his disciples. So we find ourselves in John 17 at this point, and in John 17 we are listening, we're, we're uh, able to eavesdrop on Jesus praying. We don't get to do that very often. We hear Oftentimes, as we read the Gospels, that Jesus prayed, but this is one of the special times when we are allowed to come alongside and hear Jesus praying. And what we discover is he's praying about his mission. One of the things that was on his heart was his mission, what he had come to do and why he came to do it. And so if you look at verse 1, he came to glorify the Father. He, he said, Father, glorify your Son so that the Son can in turn glorify you. And then in verse 2, he said, you have given the Son authority, and you've given the Son that authority so that he can, in fact, then give eternal life. So Jesus was focused on his mission, why he came and what he came to do. Someone has rightly said, I believe, that John 17 is like a mini course in Christianity. A mini course in Christianity in John 17, and they have said that because we have some, again, great themes of the Bible that are given to us in this one chapter, clearly one of which is the salvation that Jesus provided. So we have the great doctrine of salvation, of redemption. We have God's work in our lives in sanctification, how it is that God wants to set us apart from the world. He wants to make us a distinctive people. That's going to come yet in chapter 17. And certainly one of the things that is a key of the 17th chapter is this whole matter of eternal life. And so let's look at 
this morning, this pathway, this gateway to life. And I'd like for us to start with an understanding of what this life is. And let's do that by beginning and looking at this matter of life in the Gospel of John. Uh, if you read the Gospel of John, it becomes pretty apparent that there are numerous themes that John develops. One of those themes is this matter of life. So that in the fourth verse of the first chapter, he will say of Jesus, in him is life, and this life was the light of men. So only four verses in, he's already developing this idea that he's gonna continue to develop throughout the gospel on life. But I don't want us to just think of life alone. I want us to think about this theme of eternal life. And so when you look at what John has to say, eternal life is a key concept in the Gospel of John. John 3.16, it's one of the verses that we learn very young oftentimes in our Christian life. Our children oftentimes learn this verse very early. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting, have eternal life. Well, as much as that one verse captures the essence of so much of John's gospel, the verse we look at this morning is right alongside of that one. John 17, three is just as comprehensive, I would suggest, as is John 3.16. It's just as significant in, what ter in terms of what Jesus says as, as what he says in John 3.16. The word eternal life appears almost 50 times in the New Testament. John is going to record almost half of those times. So that gives you a sense of John looking at this matter of eternal life. So what does John have in mind? When he talks about eternal life, what does he want us to know he is talking about? So let's look secondly at this matter of eternal life. And I want to suggest to you that eternal life is two things. It is, first of all, both the matter of the quantity of life, all right? So when you think of eternal life, we think of the quantity of life. When you think of the quantity of life, what are you talking about? You're talking about the duration of life, aren't you? You're talking about a life that is gonna go on and on and on and on forever. It's a reminder to us that what God has started, he's not ever gonna stop. And if God gives eternal life, it is life in terms of the quantity of that life that is a forever kind of life. And that's the way we should look at this. We should, when we hear the word eternal life, we should rightly think of life in terms of duration. We should rightly think in terms of life that is endless and forever. But listen, the Bible says that every soul born into existence is an immortal soul. Every soul is gonna live forever. So when we think about eternal life, we're not just talking about any kind of life, are we? Because we're either going to live for eternity in a relationship with God, in the glory of heaven, or the Bible says we're gonna live forever separated from God in what the Bible speaks of as eternal death. So we're either in a relationship with God forever or we're separated from God forever. So when we think of eternal life, certainly it's about the quantity of life, but there's another aspect of eternal life that the Bible teaches. And that second aspect of eternal life is the quality of life. So we're talking about the quantity of life, yes, but we're also talking about the quality of life. It's not simply how long you're going to live because everybody lives forever. It's how you're going to live and how good that life is. It could be argued, I think, that this second aspect of eternal life may be, in fact, in focus more often than the quantity of life. At least it is as much so as that one. Jesus says in John 10, even though he didn't use the word eternal, remember in that famous statement that Jesus made, he said, I have come to give you life and to give you life in abundance, all right? I didn't come just to give you eternal life, I, I've come to give you eternal life, but I've come to give you another dimension of life. I've come to give you a life that is abundant. In, in John chapter 4, this is what Jesus says in verse 14. 
but whoever drinks of the water. Remember in his conversation with the woman at the well, this fascinating discussion that he has with her about things that are eternal as opposed to things temporal. And he says to her in verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That's what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about what? Imparting, thirdly, a kind of life that can only be described as God's life in us. That's what eternal life is. Eternal life is life is forever in terms of quantity. Eternal life is abundance in that it is a well of water springing up within us. But we are rightly to say that eternal life is God's life being lived in us. William Barclay writes this and says, to possess eternal life, to enter into eternal life is to experience here and now something of the splendor and the majesty and the joy and the peace and the holiness which are characteristic of the life of God. That's eternal life. That's the expression that John has in mind when he speaks of the fact that God is the giver of eternal life. Sure, it is endless. Sure, it is abundant. But in essence, it is the very life of God being lived within us. In Ezekiel chapter 47, Ezekiel describes this amazing scene of the temple of God. And as he describes that scene, he speaks of a river, a river of life that flows out of the temple, the very presence of God, all right? It's an imagery of life that is endless. It's a picture of God's life in us. And Ezekiel does this amazing thing as he talks about this river that flows out of the temple. He says, first of all, in verse two, it's like just a trickle of water. And then he describes it in verse three, and it's up to the ankles. And then in verse four, it's up to the knees. And then in verse five, it's up to the waist. And he speaks finally of a great river that cannot be crossed as he just seeks to describe for us God's life and the fact that God is the giver of this abundant life. And then what do you suppose we see when we turn to the last book of the Bible? In Revelation 22 and verse one, and he showed me a river of the water of life, crystal as clear coming from the throne of God and from the Lamb. That's the imagery that he wants us to see. Listen, eternal life is not something that you just add on to your life. Eternal life is not a compartment that you're going to enter into when you die. Eternal life is not simply in opposition to temporal life right now. Eternal life, rightly understood, is the life of God being lived out from within us. So that when Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any person is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, everything has become new. Or when he says in Galatians 2, 20, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not me, but it's Christ who lives within me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you see what it's saying? Eternal life in John's gospel is this great and glorious theme that speaks of the quantity of life that we receive, but it speaks also of the quality of this life, and it speaks of the quality of this life in such a way that we understand that it is in fact God's very life being lived out from within us. And all God's people said something like what? Amen, that's right, it's, it's a forever existence. So if that's the case, if eternal life is God's life within us, then the most important question that we could ask is how is this life possible? How is it that I get this life? And we look at our verse and it says this is eternal life. Jesus says this is eternal life. What is it? That they may know you God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So let's look at eternal life and the knowledge of God. Eternal life and the knowledge of God, and I want to do the same thing. John takes this idea of life, and he develops it as one of his themes. Well, this matter of knowledge, 
Knowledge is one of the key themes of the Bible. And the Bible speaks of this knowledge, and it speaks of this as something that is to be pursued, right? So that in Isaiah 11:9 it says, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Think of that. Think of that. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Jeremiah 9:24. Remember where Jeremiah says, hey, don't, don't let the, the mighty man boast in his might. Don't let the rich man boast in his riches. Don't let that guy who is so powerful boast in his power. If you want to boast, Jeremiah says, if you want to boast in something, boast in this, that what? That you know me. That's what we're to boast in. We don't boast in ourselves. We don't boast in our might. We don't boast in our riches. We don't boast in our power. We boast in our knowledge of God, rightly understood. He is simply saying to us, there's nothing more important in the pursuit of this life than a pursuing a knowledge of God. On the flip side of that, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. What do you see in our world today? You see a world that has no knowledge of God, right? And we see a world that is hell-bent towards destruction. So Paul will rightly say in Romans 1, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. They knew that there was a God. The world that they look at every day couldn't have just happened, but rather than embracing, rather than pursuing who that God might be, they turn and they fulfill their own desires and they pursue their own agenda. So listen, our task couldn't be any more urgent, couldn't be any more important than to take this truth and to make sure that we're passing it on into the lives of each other, to certainly make sure that we're passing it on into the lives of our students, to make certain that we're passing it along into the lives of our children. If in fact, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I think that's looking to the kingdom when Jesus reigns on the earth. And the thing that is going to be true of that day is the, the earth is going to be full of the knowledge of God. What could be more urgent than to make sure that our children know the value, the importance the significance of this book and of the knowledge that it imparts to us. So Jesus says, first of all, that this matter of knowledge is something that we need to pursue. Secondly, would you notice that it is to be pursued by a knowledge of God the Father? In fact, he says that it is that we are to pursue this knowledge of the only true God. There's two times that appears in the New Testament. John says it both times, all right? John says it both times. You go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding in order that we might know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true and in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. He said it in John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God. I would suggest to you that this is one of the uncomfortable onlys in the Bible. It's not the only one, but it's an uncomfortable only. What do we mean by an uncomfortable only? Jesus says that this knowledge that we are to pursue, right, is a knowledge of God the Father, who is the only true God. The word true there is opposed to that which is false. In other words, he's declaring that God the Father is the only genuine God. It's very similar to what he said about himself in John 14, 6, right? You could say John 14, 6 is, a, is one of those uncomfortable only verses because Jesus in effect said with a definite article, I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. Now, that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. It's very un-PC, isn't it? It's very not politically correct 
to say that there is one true God of all of the gods, that Muhammad is not the true God, that Buddha is not the true God, that the million gods that the Hindus worship are not the true gods, but that there is one true God. Now, that's not what I said, and it's not what you're saying. It's what Jesus said. And so if we have an argument, we have to take it up with Jesus because he's the one who said there's only one true God. And he said of this God that he is the only true God and there is no life apart from him. There is no life apart from him. We have said repeatedly as we've gone through this upper room discourse that right thinking leads to right living. Right thinking. You've got to think right. If you're not thinking right, you can't live right. And if you're not thinking right about God, then you can't possibly live in the way that God wants you to live. So it always comes back to right thinking leads to right living, and right thinking begins with right thinking about God. And so we have to have a knowledge of God. And Jesus tells us that he came so that that would be possible. So first of all, he says we have to have a right knowledge of God the Father. Secondly, he says we have to have a right knowledge of God the Son. We have to have a right knowledge of God the Son. And again, we want to keep pressing this point. How do we come to know this God? And Jesus is going to tell us that the answer is that it is only through the Son. Jesus tells us that he came to make known who the Father is. John 1.14, we beheld his glory, talking about Jesus. John says we beheld. John was right there with him. John rubs shoulders with Jesus for three plus years on the earth. And as John penned by means of the Holy Spirit this gospel account in that first verse, he says in verse 4, in him is life and that life is the light of men. Then he comes to verse 14 and he says, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, right? Full of grace and truth. Jesus came to reveal the Father. We look to Jesus, and what do we see as we look at Jesus? We see the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. People say, what's God like? He's like Jesus. What's Jesus like? He's like the Father. To see Jesus is to see the Father. To know the Father is to know Jesus. So Jesus says, I have come to reveal the Father to you. We see that, don't we, in families. It's not necessarily true all of the time, but there are, within families, sometimes you see a child and you go, I know whose child that is. I mean, you, they just look so much like one of their parents. Sometimes you can tell just by the way they act, right? And I, I mean that in a positive way. <laughs> My dad was a, a college administrator and taught uh, a couple classes uh, at the college level for almost 50 years. And I only took one class from him, and yet people that knew both of us often would say to me, you teach like your dad. Your mannerisms are just like your dad. I, I, did, I didn't sit down and consciously think, how can I do this? How does he do this? There's something about family ties, aren't there? There's something about being within a family that there is a connectedness, there is a transferring of. And so that's what Jesus says he came to do. He came to reveal the Father. Nathaniel Hawthorne, in his classic, The Great Stone Face, which is this story of a, of a little village tucked away up in a mountainous area. And up on one of those mountains, there was a shape that looked like the face of a great man. And it was the legend within the village that one day somebody who had the face of that great legend on the, on the mountain was going to come. And a little boy that was growing up in that village, as you remember that story, would look at that mountain and at that face for hours at a time. He was just enraptured by the, by the look of that mountain and that face on that mountain. And so he spent much of his time growing up and even working in the fields, looking at that face on the side of the mountain. And then later on in his life, as he comes into the village, the villagers say, there he is, he's come. It was the transferring of that imagery into his life because he spent so much time studying, thinking about, looking at 
the image on that mountain. Leon Morris says, to know God, to really know God, is to enter into a transforming experience. That's what he's saying to us here. That they may know you, Jesus said. Through me, to see me is to see the Father. There are two words in the New Testament that are often used to describe knowledge, to know something. One of them is oida, O-I-D-A. It's a word of observation. You know something by observation. You observe, I, I can look at you this morning and make certain uh, assumptions and, and say that I know something about you because I just observe, right? But the word that is used here by Jesus is not oida, it's gnosko. Gnosko is a word that speaks of knowing something by experience. It's a word of relationship. It's a word that describes the marriage relationship. And Adam knew his wife. That would have been, even though that was Hebrew, that would have been the idea of this Greek word gnosko, to know in an intimate way, to know personally, to know relationally. That's what Jesus says here. To develop this kind of intimate relationship with God, how does that happen? It happens as we trust God. It happens as we obey. It happens as we worship. It happens as we pray. It happens as we fellowship together. It happens, obviously, as we are in this word being grounded in the truth that God has made known and revealed to us. So I say to you, as I said at the beginning, the greatest need that any of us has is the need for eternal life. So let's look at what it means to know the Father and what it means to know the Son, and let's try to capture four statements with regard to eternal life and the work of God. Eternal life and the work of God. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, that they may not just know things about you, God, not that they can pass a test or a quiz on stuff about God, but that they may know you personally, they may know you intimately, they may know you because they are in a relationship with you, because you are the only true God. And I have come, Father, said Jesus, because you have sent me. This is the only time that Jesus references himself as being Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the one who has come to make God known. And so I want to suggest four things as we wrap up. First of all, eternal life is a gift of God's grace. Eternal life is a gift of God's grace. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. So we all are under the burden of death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that amazing? God has a gift that he wants to give us. And the gift is eternal life. This life that can be understood as the quantity of life, this life that can be understood as the quality of life, this life which is the very life of God, he wants to give to us. Paul says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, not because we have earned it, not because we've joined some church somewhere, not because we've been baptized, not because we've done the best we can, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So this matter of eternal life being the work of God is rightly understood, first of all, as a gift that is given by grace. Secondly, eternal life is found exclusively in Jesus. It's found exclusively in Jesus. And this is the testimony that God gives us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It says in 1 John 5, there are no secrets. You don't have to become a part of a secret society. <laughs> you don't have to learn a secret handshake. You don't have to be a part of some unknown group that just gets in on certain things that nobody else gets in on. It's right here. It, it, it's plainly presented to us as a gift that is available to everybody and it is exclusively given to us. There is one point of entry into eternal life. It's not one road that goes up a mountain, and at the top of a mountain are all the gods. No. There is one pathway. There is one point of entry. There is one passcode, if you will, 
and his name is Jesus. Thirdly, eternal life must be received by faith. So eternal life must be received by faith in Jesus Christ. So we're back again to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So there is the essence of what it is that is involved on our part. It is to trust in what Jesus did and what he did on the cross. It's to trust that what God said about each one of us is true, that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it is then to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul said in Acts 16, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved. That's what's required of us, is that we would believe and we would trust. And then finally, eternal life is something that you and I can know that we possess right now. This is the truth that God would have us know, that we possess it right now. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you hope that you have eternal life. Not that you're well on your way to eternal life. But that you would know that you have eternal life. That you possess it right now. That's why we said eternal life is not a compartment that we add on to our life. Eternal life is not something that we step into at the point of death. Eternal life is the gift that God gives us at the moment of faith and the moment that we believe. We enter into life that is endless in duration. Life that is abundant in its quality. It is the very life of God that has been imparted to us. So, I would suggest to you that the greatest need that I have and the greatest need that you have is the need for eternal life. I look at this one singular verse that defines so very much the mission of our Lord. And I think, what do we want to take away from this verse this morning? And what was impressed upon me as I looked and studied and thought about this verse is simply this. Knowing that God Almighty is my Father and knowing that Jesus is my Savior, all, all is well. Now and forevermore, all is well. This is the anchor of my life. This is the encouragement of God's objective truth to each of us this morning. This is what you want to fasten your heart onto in the world that we are living. This is what we want to take our eyes off of, of this world and put them on this truth, that to know that God Almighty is my Father, and to know that His Son Jesus is my Savior is what should get us up every morning with a sense of anticipation, with a sense of confidence, with a sense of understanding that God has something in store for us in this day. J.I. Packer said this, once you become aware that the main business that you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into a place of their own accord. The greatest thing that we can know is God. The only thing greater than that is to be known by God because we know ourselves by knowing God and we know we need a Savior. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we're so very thankful for this gift of eternal life that Jesus came to give to us. And Father, I just pray right now, if there is someone here that is not certain that they have this gift of eternal life, that before this morning is over, they would call out to you and they would recognize before you their greatest need is the need for eternal life. Father, I pray that by your Spirit you will open our eyes to understand who Jesus is, that he is the very Son of God, who we are, that we are sinners separated from you in need of your grace, and that we will believe that what Jesus did when he died on the cross was all that was necessary so that we can receive this gift of grace that you have given to us. Father God, we love you, we thank you, we celebrate and proclaim your glory. 
And we do all of this in Jesus' name, amen.